Sahanavavatu Sahanavunatu Sahaviryam Karavavai Tejasvinavari Tamasu Mavikvishavari Om Shanti 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 the practice of meditation according to the yoga sutra has got one objective And that objective is to set you free from every form of self concepts. Concepts which revolve around your imagination about the self that I am. Every concept necessarily is a mental modification. Without the material thought, concept cannot be framed. Good, bad, ugly, beautiful, holy, profane, all these are concepts. People like me, people don't like me. I am a sinner, I am a pious person. These are all various concepts. And all the concepts require thought as the medium. Without the thought, concepts cannot be formed. But the important fact about you is that your existence is not a conceptual existence. I am a precedent. In this statement, you existed even before you could be called as president. You are going to exist even after people may stop calling you the president. What is the presidentship that comes in between is purely a construct of the thought, a concept. And therefore, in the statement, I am a president, I am a husband, I am wife, I am good, I am bad, whatsoever. In this, two things are put together. One, that is concept, and the other, which is the reality, the self. I is not created by any concept. Concepts can come and go, but the self that I am remains untouched, uncreated by any of these psychological constructs. And therefore, in Yoga Shastra, now it is being told, arrive at a point where all the thoughts, all the thoughts have become absolutely still. There is no movement of the thought. When the thought is absent, how can there be any concept? 
it is not possible to have any concept without the thought. And then it is said, it is in this space you discover your true presence. And therefore, the practice of meditation is recommended by Bhagavan Paranjali. He says that the entire process of meditation, where does it culminate, where does it ultimately lead you to, that it should take you to this space where the thoughts have ceased, where the thoughts are suspended withheld. When the thoughts are required for the transactions of this world, the thoughts will be there. But when it is not required, then why should there be thoughts to constantly frame you into a concept? Because your existence is not a conceptual existence. When you say a beautiful rose, a rose is existing, but the idea of beauty that you are associating it with, the beautiful rose is a conceptual existence. The rose is there, a beautiful rose, an ugly rose, these are your concepts. And caught, trapped in these concepts, we are the prisoners of our own psychology. Nobody has set this prison for us, but we are trapped in this psychology. And therefore, to discover that our presence is beyond every form of thought is the objective of meditation. The whole exercise of meditation in the Yoga Sutra, according to the Yoga, is not to generate some special experiences. Uh, that you feel that you are floating in the air, that you suddenly feel that you know some bubbles are rising. Uh, bubbles could be rising because you have consumed wrong food. <laughs> It is not meant for that. The whole idea is to come to this point where all the thoughts can be relinquished, given up. How then, sir, can that be done? And this process is then called as the practice of yoga. Practice of yoga is not simply you know, on the yoga mat, what we do. And then, and then yoga has got good benefit, it gives me good health, etc. It's okay. That is a that is a, a fringe benefit. A fringe benefit. A fringe benefit means something which is by the way. And therefore, now to involve ourselves in this practice, to give ourselves to this practice of meditation is a commitment. When you realize and understand how important it is, it is not meant so that you can have some special experiences of relaxation, etc. Whether relaxed or tensed, the ego still continues. The personality, the person still continues. But the fact is that your presence is beyond this ideas of personality. And therefore, now we will once again, for a little while before we get into the discussion, we will have this practice of meditation. And uh, kindly put your phones on silent mode.
so that you are not disturbed or people in this room are not disturbed because of us. Once again, sit in a position where the weight is distributed equally on the, both the pin bones. And when the weight is equally distributed on the pin bones, then it is the body will naturally find its center of gravity. Your hands can rest on the knees or the hands can be brought together, locked, the fingers can be locked and kept in the front. This will allow you to make the body stable without much movement. Comfortable and steadiness of the body is the mark of accomplished posture. The posture can be said to be properly held when there is no tension in any part of the body, whether it is the hands legs, neck, back, chest, or even the face. So when you are going to sit and observe the asana, see to it that is there any tension in any part whether it is the legs, knees, back, shoulders, fingers, neck, face, beginning with chin, lips, the cheeks, area around the nose, around the eyes, the eyebrows, the forehead. Sometimes we will also find as the observation becomes subtler that the skin on the scalp on the crown of the head also has certain tension. The skin around the eyes, eyebrows, forehead, let that relax and the comfort of the body and steadiness of the body without compromising the alertness and awareness where the posture does not make you dull now the posture <coughs> is steady and one is prepared the more movement of the pranas, the inhalation and exhalation should be observed.
you will find that like the rays of the sun are quite can be withdrawn and they would merge back into the source called sun like that all the senses running out in the world are withdrawn to the center of the heart with every heartbeat the experience that i am has to be followed i am ahamasmi and then I am not even the thought I am. So the thought I am also can go to rest. I, without any definition, without any name. without any identity just your consciousness that i am and let this sink in we will continue in this process for another 12 minutes from now
Can I have that little book? So now, we, have, we know the definition of a wise man provided to us by Shri Krishna. Who is a wise man? Obviously, a person who has wisdom is called as wise man. But a definition like this does not serve the purpose. Someone says, what is a circle? That what is round. What is round? That what is a circle. So this kind of a definition really does not lead anyone to anywhere. Words are provided, but those words do not do any function of enlightening you. And therefore, now when the question is, who is a wise man? Shri Krishna says, na anushojanti panditaha. No matter what are the circumstances around, you know, either we are suffering or we are miserable because of something which is there, or because of something that is not there. You see? So we find the reasons to say that the misery, I am miserable because of something that is there, something that is not there. And in case of Arjuna, now Sri Krishna says, Gatasuna Gatasunshya a wise man is he who does not grieve for those who will pass away, who have passed away or who have yet not passed away, who are not yet dead. See, now if this definition has to be translated for us, our definition will be a wise man is he who does not grieve for something that is there or something which is not there. Now, when you are going to contemplate on this definition, 
Paribhasha, what are you going to find is, that means, wise man is he who is free from Dukkham. It does not mean that a wise man is he in whose life everything around is very flowery. Uh, everything is comfortable, everything is nice. It doesn't happen that way. In fact, if you are going to look at the life of Sri Krishna himself very closely, what would be more unfortunate that you have to be born in a jail? And not only that you are born in the jail, but you are immediately taken away from your mother even before she breastfeeds you. Dukkham. And look at the whole life. There is a series of challenges constantly. You know, but one thing that has never missed from Sri Krishna's life is his, the charming smile on his face. Yesterday also I explained this fact to you by giving the example from Rama's Charitra that when he was sent to exile, instead of being coronated and given being given the kingdom of Ayodhya, he is being told that run, go into the forest, Dandakaranya, a forest where even, you know, animals dread to enter because it is infested by the Rakshasas. Kaikai Kai sends him there, go there, Dandakaranya. And when Bhagavan Rama hears this thing from his father that he is sent into Dandakaranya, the word is Amlana Mukham Bhujashri. The luster on his face, the glow on his face did not vanish even by small fragment. Does not vanish. It remains just the same. In case of Shri Krishna too, the smile, the charm, the glow on the face, in the eyes, that luster is never ever lost. It does not become dull anywhere. No matter what are the circumstances around, but they have discovered something in which there is there is this freedom from the come. Wise man is he who has found freedom from Dukkham. What does a wise man have that he has found this freedom? Does it mean a wise man is he who looks very beautiful, handsome? Does it mean that a wise man is he who is very, very educated? Eh? Does it mean that a wise man is he who is very accomplished, successful and people keep on praising him to hey, well, what achievements? Or a very moneyed person is called as a wise man, who can be? So obviously a wise man is, cannot be defined in terms of money, success, popularity, physical abilities or anything like that. The wise man Ha, he is the one who has knowledge, who has the wisdom. What has he known that has set him free? And there we say, he has known what, that what is Puranam, that what is complete, that what is infinite. Aha. Uh -huh. So we have a little problem here. And the problem is, sir, can the infinite be known? Because whatever you may call infinite will be after all 
the idea of your finite mind, even your infinite is going to be the idea of your finite mind. Can the infinite be known? And the Shruti over here says, yes. How is it known? Is a different issue. Uh, when you enter into the realms of Vedanta, then we will discuss all these issues properly. We are not good. Because in Vedanta nothing is left to you just because Guruji is saying swallow it up. Uh -huh. That is not the parampara. That something is being said, spoken and you simply have to keep on believing it. Even in the case of Shri Krishna and Arjuna's dialogue, you will find that Shri Krishna says something on which Arjuna has an objection or a question. And thus, this is the pattern. Questions are asked, doubts are raised, and doubts are resolved by the teacher. A teacher does not feel offended because the student is asking doubts. The teacher does not say, you are having doubts because you don't have faith. In fact, we are saying that you will have doubts only because you have faith. Uh, doubt is not against faith. All that we have been hearing is that doubt and faith are against each other. But this is not true. But this is not true. I'll give you an example. And the example will follow our classical, we will follow the classical example of Raju Sarpa. Okay? Raju Sarpa means the snake and the rope. A class of Vedanta is not going to be complete without snake and rope. <laughs> What is that? Uh, those who have not heard it, just listen to it. A person enters into a room which is inadequately lit. And then he sees a snake. And then he starts shouting, snake, snake, he is palpitating, he is sweating. Yeah? He is petrified, trembling. Because if, if you are suddenly going to find a snake, in your bedroom, this is what is your reaction going to be? Oh, such nice, please sleep on my bed. <laughs> Shall I give you another pillow? No, nobody says that. Yeah, no one is going to be scared. Then let us say that person is scared, and someone whom he trusts, maybe his father or mother or some husband, wife, whatever, whomsoever he trusts, comes over there and says, It is not a snake. It is a rope. So now this person has the knowledge that it is a rope. But then he says, how can it be a rope? To me it looks like a snake. And therefore he has a doubt. Doubt means that knowledge in which both the sides have got equal weight. Earlier, he had this experience that it is a snake. But now when someone whom he trusts like his father comes and says that it is a rope, now immediately there is one more baksha, one more side which is there and that side has got equal weight as much as his experience is. It is a rope is not his experience. It is a rope is a sentence spoken by his father, let us say, someone whom he trusts. That is the sentence which his father has spoken and that sentence is not, the content of that sentence is not his experience. His experience is, I am Sarpaha, this is a snake. 
and yet in spite of it not being his experience he gives equal weight to that statement as much as his experience has now look at that he could have had easily disposed it away by saying no 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 if you wanting to kill me and that's why you are saying it is a rope it is actually a snake but you are you are deceiving me because you have something against me and that's why he could have very easily dismissed that statement that it is a rope now he has got two sides of equal way and that's why when there are these two knowledges opposing knowledges of equal way it becomes a doubt he has a doubt because he he has certain faith had he not to have that doubt in his father's statement there was no question of it ever becoming a doubt and therefore it is the ground of faith on which the doubt has raised and all the theologies around the world are saying that don't have doubt doubt is against faith and we are saying that having doubt is there because you have some shraddha some faith and doubt does not go away by saying have faith the doubt will go the doubt has to be resolved the doubt has to be resolved that doubt means something is something is ununderstood there is a lack of understanding which which is expressing as a doubt over here now this fellow says how can that be a rope switch the light on and he finds it is a rope so now his experience coincides with his father's statement it is a rope you see the knowledge he had now that knowledge becomes clear and in that clarity of knowledge now there is no doubt you see that doubt has resolved when the knowledge becomes clear and therefore how does the knowledge go or what do they call sorry the doubt go the doubt does not go by telling you have more faith and have more faith and have more faith the doubt goes in wake of knowledge in wake of more clarity of understanding which releases you from the grip of doubt but what have we what have we been told that you have a doubt because you have you don't have faith and the whole thing leads to creating a guilt complex i am doubting how, how why do i doubt you god why is there this am i papi papo hum pap karma hum i am a sinner and that's why i am doubting no you have a doubt because you are intelligent because something is left ununderstood and therefore there is a possibility of doubt the knowledge is not clear and therefore there is doubt ah so to remove the doubt what do you do create a guilt complex in someone all that you do is simply help the person to have more clarity of understanding and therefore with clarity in understanding doubts etc are resolved and therefore when we say in vedanta that there is doubt etc we welcome it we say okay we welcome so it is not left for you to just simply swallow it up because the teacher is saying it is not that in fact 
the Brahma Sutra begins. The first sutra is Athato Brahma Jinyasa. Jinyasa means a desire to know. There is a doubt and that's why you desire to know. It begins over there. <coughs> so now, a Brahma Jnani is he who is free from Dukkham. Who is free? The Brahma Jnani, that wise man, he who knows Brahman. And therefore now, I want to know what this Brahma is. Watch this Brahma is. Up to this point is our first topic where the Brahma Jinyasa has not taken place because in wake of this knowledge of Brahman one becomes absolutely totally free. Okay, now from here onwards we have one thing to see that we also see this world and when we function in this world we are directed by two things. Our interaction with the world is controlled by two things. Either our pursuit of pleasure or our insecurities is something that controls our interaction with the world. And if you simply continue to look at the world as a place to exploit it, to eke out something from it or a place from where you have to run away, hide yourself, then it is going to create only two types of personalities. A person who goes into the world only with the idea that he has to exploit, get more and more, more and more, more and more, or a person who wants to run away from the world a recluse. It is not in becoming a recluse or it is not even in becoming a hedonist that the wisdom is born. So now we have to understand that there are four types of people the Shastra says. Okay? And four types is not that, you know, once you are born, you are just that. This is a gradual development of a person too. You can say that it has, it has got some biographical value. The first is a person who lives in this world. Only he has got one motive and that is by hook or crook, all my desires should be fulfilled. Whether the means that I employ are legitimate or illegitimate, right or wrong, I don't care. All that I want is my ambitions, my desires should be fulfilled. He has no consideration for what is right, what is wrong, should be done, should not be done. This is not at all his discrimination. Such a person in the Shastra is called as a Pamara. This person is called as Pamara Pusha. All his life has got only one objective and that is get as much whatever by whatever means. I have a desire means it has to be fulfilled. Right or wrong, dharma or dharma, no consideration. If I have, an, I have the ambition to acquire power, kill, loot, murder, cheat, but stay there on the top by becoming that powerful, only to become powerful, only so that my ambition that I should be powerful is fulfilled. Such a person is called as Pamara Purusha. And therefore, just because somebody has plenty of money or sitting on the high position does not mean anything to us because on the scale of evolution, on that rung of evolution, he is on the lowest rung. Such a person is on the lowest rung. Pamara Purusha. 
the second category is of a person who says yes sir i have certain desires but that does not mean that by hook or crook the desires have to be fulfilled he sees to it that those desires are fulfilled by employing the legitimate righteous means means which are which are sanctioned by the scriptures okay shastra so he remains in the maryada of the shastra dharma and adharma for such a person right and wrong is his what he sees that is his discrimination such a person is called as vishayi purusha such a person is vishayi vishayi is not somebody who is pamar pamar and vishayi is different pamar is who has no consideration for dharma dharma right or wrong if i want money i want money i will kill loot murder whatever cheat but i will have money <laughs> you see this fellow says well i have a desire for money but i will work i will work hard and i will earn money righteous means legitimately the third category of a person uh, of people is the sadhaka okay the yogi karma yogi he sees that no matter how much you you get things from this world your desires really never get fulfilled as no matter how much you get whether it is money women whatsoever you you perpetually remain asking for more and more even even if you fulfill your desires through legitimate means a person who goes after fulfillment of the desires through illegitimate means not only remains thirsty but also gathers paap karma on his head the sadhaka the viveki purusha he says now what am i going to do the problem is not outside the problem is my own likes and dislikes which are compelling me to become miserable now and then and therefore what i want what i want to work on is to see to it that there is purity of the mind antakarna shuddhi how does he do that he says bhagavad he follows over there the scriptural advice of the teachers that karma is there whatever is my kartavya karma i will follow it but it is it is meant not for the fulfillment of desires but it is meant as my offering to the lord he sees his doing performing his duties as his act of worship so there is this yogi then finally comes the fourth which is the siddha the enlightened one the one who has now known what is the nature of brahman and that brahma is what actually is the meaning of word i and thus he is the one who is mukta so now we have these categories of people shown by the shastra the pamara the vishayi the yogi and then the mukta jivan mukta we have these categories now look at it in our life the whole quest is directed towards one thing and that is i want to find that i am fulfilled i am complete 
I because what is bothering me is really that I find I am incomplete. What you find incompleteness about yourself is not what we are asking. Somebody may find that he is inadequate, incomplete because he lacks money. The other one may say, well, I don't lack money, but I lack affection of a person. And that the third one may say that what I lack is popularity. The third person may say, what I really lack is, you know, I don't have children. What I, and therefore, what you lack is not what we, we are going to discuss. The fact is that you find that I lack, I am, I am inadequate, I am incomplete, is what one finds about himself. And therefore, what is the quest? The quest is to find that I am poor Dhamma, I am adequate, I am complete. How then this completeness are you going to discover? Because what you don't want is this I which is incomplete. And what you want is I which is complete. And how can there be a replacement of I? There is not going to be any replacement of I, it cannot be. And therefore, now the Upanishad steps in over here uh, to tell you that this self, that I which you are referring to, is by nature Purnam. Is by nature Purnam complete. What is your experience? <laughs> your experience is that I am incomplete. And what is the statement of the Upanishad? That you are complete, Purnam. And therefore now what you have is again these two pakshas, two sides. In one, your experience says that this I is inadequate, incomplete. The meaning of I is incomplete. And on the other side, the Upanishad says the meaning of this I is Pura. <coughs> Sir, how is it possible? How can I be complete? Now there is a doubt, and that doubt needs to be resolved. This resolution of the doubt is the discussion now between the teacher and the student. But before that, I am going to say, how can I be complete that what is, that is infinite? Because there is this world around me, and I am a part of this world. The world may be infinite. But I am a part of this world. I am a small little part of this world. No matter how insignificant I am. And I may strive to make myself significant. If I cannot make myself significant to 10,000 people, at least I will see to it that I make myself significant to one person. And that's why he says that I should be important to at least my wife. To my children, I am with a wife, she says that I should be, you have to recognize my importance. Make, I have, make me feel that I am significant. Why? Because I find that the world is so huge and I am insignificant. And how much significance do you want? Please again, even you are given importance all the time, but that, that is not going to be sufficient. Give me more, 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 asking for more, how much more do you want? Whatever more that you want, you are going to say it should be endless. If the husband says, I love you once, that is not enough. Then you have to say all the time, akhir tak, akhir tak. Akhir tak means what? Akhir tak means till the end means what? Endlessly. 
endlessly. Uh, you can call that sadhanam. If the world is excluded from you, that does not make you complete. And therefore, all that is seen as world also has to be included in this I. How does that happen? Is the whole, it has happening means it is a process of understanding. And in this understanding, the world is not seen as something different from the self and therefore the interaction of the jnani, of this brahma jnani, of this man of wisdom with the world is not based on insecurity or pursuit of pleasure. Please understand that when, when I say that I want to be pleased, it essentially means that I am somewhere displeased and I need to be pleased. And therefore, when one gets involved with the world, with these two things, that means there is insecurity and there is displeasure. There is some displeasure. In case of this jnani, the one who is awakened, his interaction with the world is not controlled, governed by insecurity or by his pursuit of pleasure. Then what is it? It is purely out of love for it. Why? Just as one has the love for himself, which is the natural thing to have, Atmanastu Kamaya Sarvam Priyam Bhavati, the love that you have for yourself is not taught by anyone. Is not taught by anyone. It is natural. You, have, you will have to be taught that please love your neighbor. But you don't have to be taught that you love yourself. You, you love yourself and hence whatever you are doing, you are doing for the sake of the love for yourself. Then, sir, therefore, when he discovers his oneness with the whole world, knowing that the true nature of the self his interaction with the world is not from the standpoint that we understand and we interact with the world with. It is purely out of this selfless love. Now, how does that all happen? Has been explained. Sri Krishna speaks about it. That expression is, is shown to you by Bhagavan Sri Krishna. In this end of the second chapter where Arjuna asks this question, and how does this man of wisdom sit, talk, how is he defined? How does he really interact, transact with the world? Because he has no desires. Then all that we have understood is that we require to have desires to interact, to start a transaction. How does he do that? How does that happen? Or does he become like a rock and sits over there? He says, no. He is very much alive to the life. He is responding to the need of time. He does not respond out of insecurity, fear or pursuit of pleasure. And therefore, what Ajnani has is solution to every problem. 
what an ordinary person like us has is only the problem and not a solution because he is available to respond to the world most appropriately this then is his relationship with the world now if we have understood the map of our evolution somewhere you can mark yourself where you need to progress from where to where never to remain a palmer at least have the vivek of dharma and adharma what is right what is wrong just because i have a desire does not mean it has to be fulfilled there can be a desire but that desire also needs to be led by the sense of righteousness when this happens the person has evolved from being a palmer to vishayi now being a vishayi now he can now contemplate that what is it that i truly want and when he starts thus asking that question that what is it in life that i have i have truly wanted apparently i may have wanted money pleasure recognition etc but truly what is it that is wanted by me and then he will understand that he is in pursuit of that what is poor what one wants is absolute freedom that completeness how then is that attained and achieved then comes through the knowledge of brahman and therefore now the person comes into that mode of contemplation comes arrives into that phase where he goes to the teacher and says Adhi Bhagavan Brahmeti, sir, please instruct me in that what is the ultimate reality, that satyam, what is called as Brahman, knowing which one becomes free. And this is told to Arjuna by Bhagavan when he says, Tad vidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadeksham titejyanam Arjuna, when you are seeking that knowledge, knowledge which will make you free, that knowledge has to be sought from those tattva darshis, those wise people. Go seek them out. Tadvidhi pranipatena. Go to those people with humility. Pranipat means namaskar. Pranipat means namaskar. In our Indian culture, we have a very beautiful gesture that when we meet each other, we greet by doing namaskar. When the younger people meet any elders, they, they will touch the feet and do the namaskar. It is not only some humility, but it also <coughs> means that the elders have to bless those who are young. It is the privilege of the young to be blessed by the elders. And therefore, if there are young, young, younger people who come and touch your feet, even don't say "don't do, don't do." They are not doing anything wrong. If you want to stop anybody, then stop somebody who is doing wrong. If they are asking for your blessings, your good wishes, have they done anything wrong? 
if they want to invoke that love in your heart, in an elder's heart, and then in humility that person touches the feet, what is wrong about it? Don't, no, no, don't touch. Don't touch means, I, you stop him when he is doing something wrong. When he is doing that what is right, you are stopping him. <laughs> Look at that. Better rain though, rain though. Rain though means please don't do, don't do. Tadvidhi pranipatena. Pranipata is namaskar. Humility. When we know that we are, I do not have that what I am seeking. How do you seek that? Not through arrogance. Knowledge can never be gained with pranipata. And pranipata means, actually it is like dandavat, like a stick on the floor. Pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya Serve that teacher Arjuna and just don't stay over there serving because then service will mean that feed the teacher so much that, that he finally has to burst and service, no serve appropriately and then pariprashnena ask the question for which you have come when you go to the teacher don't forget the purpose for which you had sought the teacher People will go and start doing some politics in those ashram. Come over there and do what? We want to be in the inner circle. Now there comes that inner circle, outer circle. There are all concentric circles only. Going around. Pariprashne in a sevaya. And when a person thus approaches with the right attitude, through the correct way, then Bhagavan says, then those wise people definitely will instruct you in the knowledge of Parameshwara. Upadekshantite, upadekshanti, upadesh karinge. Upadekshantite jnanam, jnaninas tattva darshina. Those who are tattva darshi. who are able to behold that reality as a direct experience, those teachers will also show you with equal clarity. And that is what is really required. Some people say, no, we go to the teacher because our teacher is very loving. That means you feel that you want to be loved and that's why you but a teacher is sought for what? A teacher is to be sought for knowledge. Go see the teacher for knowledge. Upadekshan, jnanam. And thus, in our parampara, in our tradition of the Vedas, this is how the entire problem of suffering is mitigated. Because suffering is the product of ignorance. Yeah, okay, okay. What's the difference between Tattva Jnani and Jnani? What is the difference? We are running out of the time. But I will tell you. Both of those words actually mean the same but with a little difference. A Tattva Jnani is someone who has that direct knowledge. Whereas a Jnani can be someone who has that knowledge, like in the previous case of a snake. The person whose father told him that it is a rope also has the knowledge that it is a rope. But what is the difference between his first knowledge and the second knowledge? The first knowledge that it is a rope and when the lights were switched on, 
What is his knowledge? It is a robe. The first and knowledge is the same. It is a robe. But there is a difference. Because one is direct, the other one is yet not direct. Okay? So Jnani and Tattvajnani is that is the one who has direct knowledge, one who still does not have direct knowledge. But what he speaks is correct, is not wrong. But he will be able to give that clarity. That person who has the direct knowledge can give that clarity, that knowledge, like the experience of holding an apple in your hand, uh, as clearly as that. All right, so this is the man of wisdom for whom the world is not a place to be afraid of. World is not a place which he has to, you know, exploit. But world for him is not apart from his own being. And that's why he has the sense of equanimity towards all. Whether it is an animal or a human being, whether it is a man or a woman, whether it is rich or poor, whether it is an educated person or an uneducated person, for him all are seen with this sense of oneness, equality. The equality that we are seeking over here is not the true equality, it is an art, artificial, but the equality that he has is his own nature. It is not brought by law, but it has come through his direct knowledge, direct experience. That is how the man of wisdom sees this world. Okay? Om Purnamadaha Purnamidam Purnahar Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti Vashanti Vashanti Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Bhadarayam Sutra Bhashakata Vande Varavanta Opunapuna Ishvaro Purnatmeti Murti Bheda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadvyakta Dehaya Dakshina Murta Yenamao Thank you all.